My expertise, I, I consider my strengths more in the, the field of practice and, and, and applying the research. Um, so, you know, the, the, basically the, the, from the second point on, we're really going to focus on the to-dos. I like to give my audience really, um, you know, things you can, you can take and apply in your practice. Um, I find that a lot of presentations really lack on that. You kind of come out here in a bunch of research, and, um, and that's great. Obviously, we need to be empirically validating everything we're doing, but you know, having some real tools that you can apply in different ways, I think, is very important. And, um, and when I, when I kind of describe what, what I do and what you can do, hopefully you can be thinking about ways in which you can apply that in your own practice, whether it be just a simple tool that might be helpful for an individual client, to all the way using the, the intervention itself as a whole for, for something that you're working with. Okay, so, um, without cheating and looking at that little picture there, don't look up, um, tell me what comes to mind when when you think of the word coach, just shout it out. Support. Support. Well, I heard another one. What else? Advisor. Teacher. Leader. Leader. Gentle. Hmm. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> Gentle and tough. Okay. Yeah, firm and gentle. <laughs> Champion. Champion. Tough love. Tough Inspiring. Inspirational. Inspirational. Mentor. Sports. Sports. Aha. Model. 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 <laughs> Anything else? Practice. Practice. I should say that. That's a good one. Expensive. Planner. Expensive. <laughs> Planner. Planner. Yes. Anything else? Uh, disciplinar. Disciplinarian. Yeah. I think of a focus. Also <laughs> accountability. Yes. Uh huh. Good one. Repetition. Repetition. Yeah. Repetition. Okay. So we have support, teacher, leader, advocate, gentle, tough, champion, inspirational, mentor, model, practice, expensive, planner, disciplinarian, focus, accountability, repetition, and sport. I was curious if you would get there. It took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think it was the tenth thing was sports that I heard. Um, and some people don't say it at all. You know, it's interesting. Um, the, you know, in the 80s, you know, if you said that word, then you would probably get all sports-related answers. Um, but since the 80s, we've kind of had this coaching phenomena, um, you know, blow up, and we have every kind of coach imaginable now. Um, but what we're going to talk about is, ADHD coaching as it relates to the field of mental health and how we can integrate coaching approaches into our practice. Now, when you think of a therapist, what words on here would you take off? Sports. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? Champion. Champion? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so you can see a lot of overlap, right? Um, so we're going to talk about kind of where the overlaps lie and where the differences lie, um, if there are any. You might. I can guarantee some of you are going to come out here thinking that there's not really a difference, and some of you might see a difference. Um, that's kind of arguable. Um, but, but, but you guys got a lot of the words, and I think 
you know, this guy up here in this in this picture, um, he has a couple more. Ins did we do inspiration? Yeah, we did. Inspirational, um, vision, teamwork. Now that we'll we'll talk about how that could could differ in your your opinion in terms of therapist versus coach. Um, <clears throat> now the coaching model um, that I use. Um, and uh, and practiced by is based in in two theoretical models CBT and psychoeducation um, that we've kind of talked about a lot. Um, so we rely on our executive functioning. As as I mentioned, I'll break that down. Um, I think in the next slide um, is a way of understanding client difficulties and then formulating coaching goals. Um, EF is it's kind of a hot hot uh, topic right now. It's becoming more popular in the literature as a way of describing the etiology and the deficits associated with, with ADHD. And as we mentioned, a lot of other disorders as well. Um, so again, I brought this idea up earlier. Russ Barkley, who's kind of one of the leading re researchers in this field, um, talks about how ADHD is not so much a skill deficit, but difficulty with behavioral execution and then that buzzword self-regulation. So due to the EF deficits, people with ADHD have significant difficulty implementing and then persisting with the coping techniques. Um, they can't sacrifice that immediate reward for a longer term reward or, or to avoid some, some later harm to themselves. So what is executive function? I thought um, this nicely kind of breaks down the different areas we think of when we talk about executive function. We've already talked about working memory. Someone brought that up earlier. And recall, um, working memory is that ability to hold facts in your mind while manipulating information, um, accessing facts stored in long-term memory. I, I do another presentation on uh, different types of of procrastinators and it basically my theory is that you know we talk about time management and procrastination in terms of kind of this one blanket thing but I found in my work that people who have deficits in different areas of executive functioning procrastinate for different reasons and therefore need to use different coping techniques so for example um, working memory and recall, and I use character references to make it kind of fun. So if you think of Winnie the Pooh, there's this story where Winnie the Pooh um, and Piglet want to catch a woozle. You guys know that one? <laughs> I have little ones. So um, I don't know if I get this story exactly right, but it works really well for me. So um, basically, they decide they want to catch this make-believe creature, and they get Pooh's last jar of honey. And they set out the jar of honey because they decide the woozles really like honey and they're going to capture him in this hole. And um, they go home and Pooh wakes up from sleeping with a rumble in his tummy like he gets and wants some honey and finds that it's gone. He remembers that they had left it out somewhere, but forgetting the whole thing about the woozle, he goes to find the honey and falls in. And his little legs are kicking outside of the jar. And along comes Piglet and he starts jumping and screaming because they've caught a woozle and he's excited and scared and everything. So I use that as kind of my working memory deficit example that, that Pooh, because he didn't have the ability to store and then retrieve that information, um, found himself in, in trouble. And so somebody who struggles with working memory and recall might be quote unquote procrastinating simply because they don't remember all the steps of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and so, so treating that is going to be different than treating someone who has a deficit in a different area. You're going to have to work with repetition and consistency for that individual um, in order to help them not have so many balls in the air coming kind of full circle to what we were talking about before. Um, activation and arousal and effort we mentioned earlier is um, another area of exec executive function deficit. So that ability to get started on a task, sometimes once they get started, they, it, it's fine. So you really just have to focus on how to get that first piece done. Um, 
with that, you know, some of the the kind of quick and quick and uh, dirty examples are like uh, if you have a student who needs to work on a um, a worksheet of math problems covering up all but the first line of problems so they visually cannot even see the whole the whole picture and say don't worry about getting the worksheet done I just want you to get this this first line here done and breaking it down to a point where it's small enough that they say okay I can handle that and once they get started nine times out of ten you'll see that they can continue on with their work so breaking down things can be done in time segments it can be done in physical segments um, when we talk about organization later you can think of ways to to organize um, smaller and smaller so it's just really breaking it down so that they can get started controlling emotions so a lot of times we think about the executive functions in terms of those um, academic or workplace related things that affect us but it also is going to um, in influence their ability to tolerate frustration, act impulsively, speak impulsively, um, and, and and control their emotions otherwise. Internalizing language, using your self-talk to control your behavior and direct future actions is, is a really big part of executive functioning. Taking an issue apart, analyzing the pieces, reconstituting and organizing organizing it into new ideas so that complex problem solving and that's why we see a lot of overlap a lot of these kids like with math that's the, one of the most complex subjects um, so it, you know they have trouble on specific subjects due to these deficits in executive functioning and then shifting inhibiting so changing activities stopping an existing activity, stopping and thinking before acting and speaking. With really little kids, you see this a lot, where they'll be doing fine in an activity, and then a, a teacher says that they try to move on to the next thing, and the kid just falls apart, and that's when the symptoms really flare up. Um, so making sure that you're giving verbal warnings over and over that a change is about to occur whenever possible, um, giving, you know, we'll, have, we'll do parent work where parents do um, pictures of kind of what's going to happen next so the kid is, is prepared, um, ready for that shift in behavior. Organizing and planning ahead. Um, this is a typical one people think of. Um, you're organizing your time and your space. Um, your projects, your materials, your possessions, and then monitoring. So just kind of being aware and monitoring your behavior and, and prompting is affected in executive function. So you can see how each one of these things can affect multiple areas in the individual's <coughs> life. Um, but it's important to kind of be able to pick apart with your client which ones are most affected for them so that you can use the, stra the correct strategies. You know, AD even within the symptomology of ADHD, you know, it, it's, it's not just kind of one, one big thing. ADHD isn't just a person who can't focus and sit still. You know, there's all these little pieces. So you as the practitioner need to be able to identify where the deficits are for that person and, and, and hit those on behaviorally. So here it is, here's where you can kind of decide for yourself. Is it CBT? Is it not CBT? Um, I tend to personally think of uh, ADHD coaching as a specific CBT intervention rather than a different entity in and of itself. Um, so, and again, I think it comes down to the environment you're in and what kinds of goals you're focusing on with the clients. As I mentioned, if you're in a primarily academic environment and you're focusing on those types of goals, um, you could probably consider it something separate than CBT. Um, if you're in private practice and you're dealing with comorbidities and you have clients with goals to reduce symptoms of anxiety or depression, um, which you can work into the model, um, then you're probably more conducting an intervention within CBD itself.
Um, so after that explanation, how many people feel like it's kind of just, and, and your opinion might change, but how, how, do, how many of you feel like it's kind of just a, a particular model within CBT? Oh, not many. So a lot of you feel like it's something different? Or you just don't know? <laughs> or you fell asleep? <laughs> Still thinking about it? Need more information? Yes. Okay. Don't care? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always... Things to think about. Um, what were some of the... Okay, so this word like disciplinary in here um, that, that you guys wanted to, to cross off. I, I think of coaching as a little bit more... Um, a little bit more directive than, than therapy. Um, it's, it's a problem-solving approach in a together sense. Um, so it, a coach isn't a teacher or a parent, per se. Um, we're not going to tell the client what to do. But it's, it's more of a back-and-forth problem-solving approach. Um, in the second example bullet here, you see the um, things like um, first, identifying the issue or goal, brainstorming potential solutions together, discussing the pros and cons of each strategy, selecting that solution, and then discussing the specific barriers that might arise and how to overcome them, implementing a task or strategy in the following week, and then reevaluating. Um, so it's a little more, I think, interactive. Um, and it, of course, it's always, I think, more valuable to have your client come to an answer than, than um, for you to just supply it for them. But it's, I think, a little bit more active in the way you can lead them there. Um, so motivation is, is critical to coaching, uh, which I don't necessarily think, you know, um, did we take that one out? No. Um, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, Therapists motivate, but it's not quite in the active way as you're going to see that, that we do um, in our coaching model. Um, we actually use incentives and consequences um, that are laid out and, and talked about every week. Um, and that's, that's pretty much an integral part that I think a lot of therapists might not do, even if there are goals that are set up. Um, <clears throat> so... Clients encourage to manage those incentives um, and then work towards utilizing more internal motivation. So take that back to the idea of self-regulation. Um, the idea is that these clients, say they're ha having difficulty with that internal sense of self-regulation. So we're going to use an external uh, motivator or incentive for them. But the idea is that over time and through discussion and, and process that you can start to kind of internalize that for them a bit more so that it becomes a more natural and an internal um, uh, just a way of being rather than um, a constant kind of bribe in their life to get something done, if that makes sense. We get a lot of concerns from parents that say, you know, if I reward this behavior, aren't I we're just rewarding something that they should already be doing? And the answer is no, that there's, you know, there's a method to the madness, that, that it's, it's in an attempt to internalize that for them um, and make it more salient. You'll also get those parents that say, I've tried incentives and it doesn't work with my kids. And 99% of the time, they're just... They just haven't found the right one. They haven't found the right currency, or they're using it in the wrong manner, or they are, for example, you know, there's a difference between your kid not doing their homework, and then you say, um, forget it, I'm taking away your cell phone, and you're grounded this weekend, to saying, sitting down with the child and saying, okay, you know, if you don't finish your, your homework, what do you feel would be uh, a, a, a uh, you know, good reward or consequence for that behavior and that action? So not only are they a part of it, they're part of the discussion, but they also know ahead of time what they're going to be giving up. 
um, as a result. A lot of times it's not laid out for them ahead of time, and, and that can be the simple solution right there. Um, it's just kind of thrust upon them after a behavior, and the parent didn't even decide ahead of time. They just kind of spit it out at the time. But um, we're going to talk about how to write a good long-term goal, because I think that that's where a lot of the, the most important work gets done is in those first couple of sessions because then everybody's on the right page and you're working towards the same thing. These clients are notorious for coming in, I don't know if you notice, and, and the first couple of weeks, there's the, this is the big problem in their life. And then four weeks down the road, you're not even talking about that anymore. Um, and it's not necessarily because something else is more important and you've uncovered the, the, real, the real thing that's important, sometimes it's just because they're having trouble staying on track. And if you kind of go there with them, you're not going to accomplish anything in the long run. Um, so it kind of fights that, that, you know, go with your client thing that we're all taught early on <laughs> and where your client needs to go because with ADHD, sometimes that's not the best thing because that's what they're used to doing is becoming distracted and then distracting others and then letting go of the, the long-term goal that they originally had set out to do. So you're teaching them to build stepwise. I use the, um, in almost every intake that I do, I use the metaphor of building a house. And when you build a house, what's the most important part? Foundation. The foundation, right? So if you don't build a solid foundation, which is what most of these clients will do, is they've kind of spent their life throwing up walls. They have a vague idea of what they want to achieve. They know where their problems are. They know what the strategies are, so they just kind of throw up walls. So they're like, I'm going to create a spot for my keys, and I'm going to um, you know, start using this planner. And they just start doing it. But until you've built a solid foundation, which is your long-term goals, those walls are ultimately going to come crashing down. And that's where those failures happen. And then they build back up, and then they fall down. They never, ever reach the point of building that roof. So it's your job to work with them on building that solid foundation and then sticking to it, and then little by little building wall upon wall, layer upon layer, little by little. Um, so it becomes kind of a, a, an art form within a very um, concrete intervention. Here's where coaching, I think, is so awesome for kids. Well, a couple reasons. First is, is the stigma. We get clients that just by calling it coaching, mm -hmm. kids that would never go to therapy will come to us. Um, they're familiar with coaching. And the first thing I'll do is talk to them about, like, do you play any sports? OK, well, what is your coach there to do to help motivate you to hone your skills and teach you some strategies that you might not know and improve your game, that's what I'm here to do. You know, so, so they're OK kind of with that idea of coaching, um, which can be really helpful. Um, what was my second idea? I know I had another brilliant idea. <laughs> um, man, idea of coaching. It'll come back. Oh, here's the other one. Got it. OK. The fact that it's so behavioral yeah. takes the pressure off. Um, so I don't go in there saying, so tell me how you feel about this, and how did that affect you? Because that's the scary for a lot of kids. So I just focus on, OK, we're going to you know, improve your behavior in this area. And usually what happens is, by doing that, they start to open up to you, and you get more information about the other things. But by tackling it from that aspect, um, I just find that it's a lot less threatening for them, and they, and they, they end up opening up anyway. Anyone else? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I was glad you, you mentioned uh, coaching and how it's a, a good thing around how the kids perceive it because uh, I'm struggling with the coaching thing. I don't know, okay. how, I don't know how relevant it is, uh, okay. but in fact, just yesterday I was talking with another counselor and uh, we were talking about some news that had come out about this mayor of Toronto that has a yeah. sponsor coach and I guess one of the things that was mentioned was that they're doing step work together which is from 
12 step based programs. Oh, yeah. And, you know, so that brought up a kind of a negative uh, feeling for me personally. And, um, mm -hmm. and then I, I, I did say sports right away when you asked. Mm -hmm. right away, I just said it kind of low. Uh, the connotation of coaching is a lot different for me compared to counseling or therapy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get my arms around that because, you know, it, it is a big part of the skilled helping arenas now. And But, uh, you know, I'm looking at this basic rules of coaching. I, I played sports, mo you know, many years in coach. Mm -hmm. And number three, motivation is a critical part of coaching. That is true, no doubt. But the other two, it's, it's almost divergent. Uh, from what I always learned about the coaching model. Okay. It wasn't a democracy and it wasn't a problem solving <laughs> with, with the player. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I could just see somebody trying to convince like a Bear Bryant or someone like that to, <laughs> to, to go with that. But, um, and I don't, again, I don't know how relevant it is, but. I, I think that, yeah, I think that part's a matter of, of perception because, yes, a coach, a coach leads and guides, but he doesn't go physically kick the ball for the player. So it's kind of the lead Amanda fish versus, or teach, teach, teach to fish kind of versus fish. So, you know, it's, that, that's kind of the perspective. It's not necessarily that you don't, you know, have a leadership role and guide, um, but but you're not going out there and you're not a home organizer. You're not going to go and you know. And I tell I I tell people that you know we're not a tutor in the sense that we're not going to sit down with the client and do their math homework with them. But we will problem solve how to approach that assignment in the most effective way for them. Um, and I think a good coach does that too. You know, I think the best coaches aren't, you know, they're, they're giving the players an opportunity to figure out where their strengths are and how they play the game best. Um, I was a soccer player growing up and, and now there's all this, um, this is a little bit off track, but there's, you know, all this, I tore my ACL as a, as a high schooler and all these girls do it now and we're finding that we were teaching girls to play like boys. Mm -hmm. And it was causing problems and causing us all to tear ACL. So it's kind of like that. It's kind of like working with, you know, working with the girl's body rather than against it, um, and and kind of letting some things be figured out and not not forcing every player to to do the same thing and kick the same way and things like that. So in that way, it's a little more problem solving. Or and I think, like I said, any good coach should be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And, and another way I explain coaching to people when they come in, well, I have a, a lot of these metaphors. I'll give you a couple of my favorites. So um, <clears throat> if you think about a, a, a college campus and think of your brain as that, that map of the college campus and you've got sidewalks from this building to that building, okay? So you think of their brain centers and the connections that you're trying to make. So some people take alternate paths and the grass starts to wear thin, you know, and you start to see it wear down. And they get there faster from point A to point B. And if you stop walking those paths, then the grass grows back ultimately. So that's kind of the objective in coaching in terms of the effect we're trying to have on your brain. You know, there's these connections that already exist, but it's kind of like taking the byway instead of the freeway. It might be the better route for you. But you also have to use it or you're going to lose it. So we're, we're building those strategies and those connections for you, and it's up to you to, to keep building those. Another one along those lines that I use is um, the idea of a toolbox. And I'll show you later that I actually have a literal toolbox, but um, there's no silver bullet. And I think that's an important conversation to have with your clients, too. Um, medication isn't one, which, you know, a lot of people h hope for. Um, but even, you know, coaching isn't one either. You're not going to come out of ADHD coaching with, like, the way to do it that's going to fix all your problems. 
And that's the nature of the disorder. Again, going with the idea of you don't want to fight the strengths, um, they're going to lose interest when things become redundant and boring. So you need to have multiple methods to do things with. So if you think of a toolbox, you want to fill your toolbox. That's the goal of coaching, is to come out of, your, of coaching with your toolbox filled. You might have a hammer and a nail gun, which do the same job, but at different times you're going to use the hammer and at other times you're going to want to use the nail gun. So it's filling those and then the objective is not just for them to meet the goals of coaching. I mean, that, that, that's the objective, but that's not your grand master scheme. What you want to accomplish is for them to come out and be able to pull out those tools in a different scenario and apply it in a different way. And then when that one becomes boring, put it away and pull out another one. You know, I'll have a lot of clients who come in and say, I tried that, that didn't work. And I say, okay, well tell me about that. And they're like, well, it worked really well for like four months and then I had to stop. And I'm like, that worked, it worked great. It just only worked for four months. So we need something else that you can pull out after it gets boring, but you can pull it out again later because it worked for four months. That's terrific. You know, so it, it's getting them past that idea too. And, and yourself, I think, you know, as a therapist, you're like, oh, okay, that didn't work. You know, so don't do that. So you need to get past that yourself. Here's the problem when it comes to ADHD. There, well, there's a couple of problems, but <laughs> here they are for you. Okay, so let's say you have a student who has mastered the art of procrastination and working at the 11th hour and they can put off the biggest research paper on the face of the planet until the last minute, get really, really stressed out, but produce a really, really stellar paper, and they end up with an A. Well, they met their goal, but not without a lot of uh, emotional um, you know, results in terms of stress and anxiety and maybe depression and, and physiological responses and things like that. So it wasn't necessarily a healthy goal for them to meet. On the other hand, you might have a student work really, really hard and really consistently, and they do every assignment in a timely manner, and they just do poorly on a test one day, or they write a paper that wasn't so good, and they don't get their A. Well, then they're devastated because they didn't meet their goal. So when you're thinking about formulating goals, it doesn't necessarily just make it good because it's measurable and action driven and all those other things. You really need to think about what are you focusing on. You need to focus on their process throughout. And that's also going to help keep you on track as well. So I would write a goal in terms of an academic schedule with a, with a client of um, creating and following through with a weekly assignment schedule um, in a timely manner, you know, so you're, you're still specific and, and for the next six months or maybe that's too long, for the next three months. So you add in your, your time factor to make it time sensitive, you make it measurable, all those other things, but you're basing it on what their effort is going to be like throughout the time. Does that make okay. sense? A little bit left. All right. So let's get through the, some of the specific strategies um, that you can apply uh, in different ways. As I mentioned before, if you're a practitioner who doesn't feel like you have the capability to take on the entire intervention, these might just be some of your takeaways. I, I try to include some things that I feel like you don't hear every time you hear somebody talk about ADHD. Uh, I feel like some of those, you know, you kind of hear over and over again. You're like, got that one. So I tried to be a little bit um, unique and pull, pull from some of the um, more interesting tools that I use. Um, <clears throat> starting off with a couple of, of timers. Now, we obviously know that time management is, is a difficulty with individuals with ADHD, so having a timer can be helpful. Um, but there's some unique ones out there um, that I don't think everyone knows about. The, the most popular one and commonly known one is, is called the time timer. Are any of you familiar with that one? Oh, not many. Okay, let me pull up a picture of that one. Got it here somewhere. 
Is it an app or an actual? Part? It is both. Um, the Time Timer started as, and you can find it on timetimer.com. Um, it started as about a, um, a clock about this big, um, and it was just to sit on your desk. And now they have time timer watches. They have an app that's only a couple of bucks that does the same thing. But basically, the only difference between itself and a regular time timer is that it has this red overlay. And on the app, it's just colored red, which actually shows the amount of time. So they get a visual rep representation. Because when you tell someone with ADHD they have 10 more minutes that can get totally lost on them, what that exactly means. So they actually see the visual of the time ticking down. It's a really cool product. Um, I'll even set this at the beginning of a session so we can keep on course. And we say, OK, we're going to spend about 20 minutes talking about the previous week. And then we're going to move on to um, the, the, the next week. And so it kind of keeps both of you on track in, in the session. Um, I also really like. This, um, and I've talked to the maker of this thing, and he's developing some new products, too. This is just it's called the Daytex Smart Cube Timer. And as you can see on each side, it just tells you 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's as simple as just setting it down with the number that you want on top there, and it starts counting down from that time. Oh, wow. What's it called? Talk about the Eisenhower grid. Uh, have any of you guys used this or are familiar with it? OK, that's a cool one then. OK, so supposedly what Eisenhower, the Dwight Eisenhower, said is that what is important is rarely urgent, and what is urgent is rarely important. OK? So that's kind of how this, this idea works here. Have your client draw a grid, and we have one, two, three, four. And this helps if they're having trouble kind of prioritizing in their lives. Okay, so this is kind of on a scale from really urgent to not urgent to very important to not important. What tends to happen with a lot of clients with ADHD is they live in this first quadrant. Everything becomes urgent. So it's kind of that like firefighting lifestyle. Um, they put off the things that, that are important because there's always something that's coming up that's urgent. And that's where that stress and anxiety comes into play. So ideally, we want them, and they might vacillate between this to here, basically. It's kind of living in the extremes. I'm either putting out fires, or I'm doing something that's completely not important and not urgent. What we want to do is help our clients kind of get to this two box, where they're living in a place where they're focusing most of their attention on what's important. And obviously, urgent things are going to come up, but um, you want to be focusing most of your time here. Now, what's the difference in terms of the goals that we're talking about in urgent and important? A crying baby, urgent and important. So those things are going to happen. But things like improving my relationship, getting healthier, improving my, my time management to improve my job situation. Those aren't necessarily urgent, but they're very important in terms of, of um, lifestyle. And what will happen is they wait until it starts to creep into here to do something. So they're waiting until their spouse is threatening divorce, or they get fired from their job. Um, and, and that's just very, not a very healthy way to be, and that's, again, going to drive up that stress and anxiety. So I have clients do this when they're having difficulty really understanding that, and, they, and we'll list several items in their life, and we'll kind of say, OK, which quadrant does that go into? And then they start to see where they're focusing their energy atten and attention and where it should be focused. It's a pretty cool exercise.